Good morning. Welcome to our Encounter Bible Study. This is for Sunday, March 28th, even though we are, are, are studying it on Saturday the 27th. I hope that this study will really help you prepare for our worship tomorrow, whether you plan to watch uh, worship uh, on video or whether you plan to be present at First Cumberland or maybe even at your own church for worship. I hope today's Palm Sunday uh, study will help you uh, even better worship tomorrow. We're going to see the, the scripture come to life through the LUMO project. They are making the scriptures available to multiple, multiple languages, 750 so far through this project. Uh, here, let us see uh, the, the Palm Sunday story as told in Luke uh, in English uh, through uh, the LUMO project. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany, at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Say, The Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. You may remember last week we talked about the fact that Jesus is in Jericho and kind of ends his public ministry in Jericho and now is making his way to Jerusalem for Holy Week for the, the climax, of course, of his, his ministry. He is coming definitely up from Jericho. Jericho is 864 feet below sea level and Jerusalem is 2575 feet above sea level. And so in the, the few dozen miles from Jericho to uh, Jerusalem, uh, he's going to be traveling up 3439 feet. And as we talked about last week, uh, Jericho is this oasis fed by underground springs. And as soon as he steps outside of Jericho, he is in the Judean desert. And it is very much like a desert. So it's a hot, dusty climb uh, all the way up those uh, more than 3,000 feet up to Jerusalem. But Jesus isn't climbing it alone. His disciples are with him, but so are uh, thousands and thousands of pilgrims coming to Jerusalem for the Passover festival, not only coming up from Jericho, but from all directions, streaming into Jerusalem, singing the pilgrimage psalms, which are uh, right in the middle of the psalm book, or actually, I guess, more close to the end, in the 120 through 134 or so. And some of the psalms that they are singing, these songs of ascent is what it says in, in your scripture usually. Uh, psalm 122, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And they're singing that because they're making their way of 
course, to the house of the Lord. Or Psalm 125, those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved but abides forever. And as you're walking up uh, these mountains and wa making your way to Mount Zion, obviously it feels like this is permanent. You know, I am not permanent. I am worn out. I'm feeling my mortality as the heat bakes down on me and as I walk this long uphill climb. And yet it feels like, of course, Mount Zion is forever. They're making their way, of course, towards Passover. Uh, Passover was one day, and then that inaugurates seven days of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And quite significantly, I think for us this year, Passover begins today, March 27th. And so tonight, observant Jews around the world will, will observe and celebrate God's uh, redeeming them from slavery, uh, rescuing them from slavery in Egypt, but also all of the ways that God continually rescues us from slavery, the way that God continually demands that justice uh, be made upon the earth. And so that will be the celebration for tonight. And then that begins seven days of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and that will end next Sunday on April 4, and that is the same day, of course, that we will be celebrating Easter. And so all of these people are coming into Jerusalem, singing and excited. They're coming to the biggest festival of the year. Uh, Jerusalem had twenty or 30,000 people uh, as their population, but at Passover time, 100,000 or more would come into town. So the place is just packed, and there is, is the sights and the smells and the sounds of all of those people and all of their animals and all of that, that excitement and everything that is going on. Many who are coming along with Jesus are hoping that indeed that this Passover will be like a Passover unlike any other since that original one. That Jesus is coming to be king and Jesus is coming to, to redeem them and res rescue them from the brutality and the slavery of the Romans. They get just outside of uh, Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany. These are two little villages up on the Mount of Olives. And the Mount of Olives are the last step you go to. And you can look across the Mount of Olives, down the Kidron Valley, and then back up to Mount Zion, to Jerusalem. And there, gleaming in the middle of the city, is that beautiful, beautiful temple. And they get to just outside of Bethany and Bethpage. They can look across and see Jerusalem. And Jesus says, as they are looking across, and, and it also gets much greener there. It's almost like you've stepped out of the desert and back into where there's vegetation. And so perhaps they're resting in the shade of some trees. And Jesus says to two of the disciples, uh, go and, and uh, uh, find uh, in the village ahead of you, we're not sure which one of the two it was, a donkey, a colt, tied up. It's a colt that's never been ridden. And untie it and bring it to me. And he says, if anyone asks you why you need to do that, then uh, just simply say that the, the master or the Lord has need of it. Now, many of you, if you know me very well at all, know that uh, my uh, sport of choice is ride and tie. And ride and tie is two people and one horse, sometimes a donkey as well. Some people use donkeys. Uh, and uh, you uh, have one person riding, and they'll ride for a ways, and then they get off, and they tie the horse to a tree, and they start running. And then the other one is somewhere behind running, and the runner comes up, finds the horse tied to the tree, unties the horse, gets on the horse, and runs or rides the horse to catch the runner. A couple of years ago, I was making my way up a very difficult hill, and I was on foot. And I looked up ahead, and I saw a white horse, and I thought it was my horse. And all of the horses that we have that we compete with, I have a different little greeting that I call out to them when I see them on the trail. And so I see this horse tied to a tree, and I call out, Cruzy, Cruzy, I'm coming, I'm almost at you. And almost the words had not come out of my mouth before I heard a voice behind me say, and it was a voice of my friend and on that day competitor, Nikki Mutant, and she said to me, Courtney, don't you dare take my horse. And then I realized the horse that I thought was my horse was Nikki's horse. And it is bad form, not to mention illegal, to take someone else's horse in ride and tie. And we might think that it is bad form for Jesus just to say, go find this donkey tied to a, uh, uh, tied up in town and, and untie it and bring it to me. That sounds like bad form or illegal as well. But Jesus is really making a point here. And it was a point that the donkey's owners must have understood point was that when a king comes to town, the king in, in that day, and really in some ways in this day, can basically appropriate whatever it is that he might need. And so if he needs a donkey or a horse, they just take it. And, and hopefully, if they are a good king, they would return it 
when they are through, but that isn't the point. If the king has need of it, the king can take it. The king can, can appropriate it. Not unlike the way that Jesus said to Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, today I'm coming to your house. I'm kind of appropriating your house. You don't really have a choice. I'm inviting myself. Jesus is doing this. We would assume, although we don't know, that the owners of the donkey knew those disciples and they knew that they were disciples of Jesus. Perhaps they too were disciples of Jesus and they recognized that Jesus here is saying, I am the king and I am in need of your donkey. And so they allowed the disciples to take the donkey and to allow Jesus to get on it. Now this is uh, Jesus uh, fulfilling scripture and making a very important statement. Uh, the scripture that that Jesus is fulfilling there is uh, comes from uh, Zechariah 9 9 that says rejoice greatly O daughter Zion shout aloud O daughter Jerusalem lo your king comes to you triumphant and victorious is he humble and riding on a donkey on a colt the foal of a donkey and so the king is coming and he is both victorious and triumphant but he also is humble as he rides on a donkey in that day and age, a king who came into town on a great war horse was coming in announcing his uh, sovereignty and announcing that he was there on conquest. And you better look out because here comes the king. But a king coming into town riding on a donkey is indicating that I am coming to serve you as my king. I'm coming not in conquest, but actually in service. And that's what Jesus was doing. Now, when we hear Jesus say to his disciples, say to those that, that, are going, that, that own the donkey, the Lord has need of, of um, him, uh, that word Lord for us is just kind of ambiguous. Somebody who is greater than me is Lord, although it's not really a language we'd use for anybody. We know that in England they have the House of Commons and the House of Lords, and the House of Lords is, is the higher house. Uh, but beyond that, Lord is just kind of ambiguous, just a, a person in a position of, of authority above us in one way or another. But actually it had a very specific meaning in that day and age. Kyrios is the Greek, and Caesar, as we learned back when we talked about the coin, a couple of days ago that Jesus held the denarius that had Jesus had Caesar's picture and Caesar's title. Caesar is Lord. Caesar is Kyrios would be on that denarius. And when the Jesus says the Lord has need of him, say that to, to them, uh, the, the people knew it wasn't Caesar, but they recognized Jesus is claiming something for himself. Something that the early Christians are also going to claim for Jesus. Jesus is Lord. And to say Jesus is Lord is to say Caesar is not Lord. There really is only one Lord. And so if Jesus is Kyrios, if Jesus is Lord, then there is no other. And so Jesus mounts this colt that has never been ridden before. And all of us who are people who ride horses know, boy, that's taking, that. there's a lot of bravery in that. Even in the video we saw where it is a very tiny, small animal. Um, they can buck and kick and, and usually they do not want to be ridden. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more in the worship service tomorrow. And yet Jesus gets on him, must have been, been an outstanding horseman. And he begins riding this colt into this huge throng of people. And here's one of the things I imagine. The owners of the cult understand that Jesus is making this statement. He is fulfilling scripture and he's making this statement, I am a king, but I'm coming in, uh, in service to you. And, and they kind of miss that second part. And they begin telling people, the Lord, Jesus, the Lord, the Messiah, he is coming, riding on a colt, fulfilling this prophecy in uh, Zechariah, and now we must go ahead of him. And, and they, they are, they are uh, announcing to the crowds, the king is coming, the king is coming. And so the crowds begin lining uh, the, the route so that they can see the king coming into Jerusalem. And they're ready for the king to come in and throw out all of the Romans. And as word gets out, as Jesus gets closer and closer, the crowds get even thicker and thicker, but they're parting as he comes ahead of them so that they can see him. And as we do even to this day, they roll out the red carpet. In this sense, they put down the, the branches that they've cut from palm trees and they lay their cloaks out before Jesus and the donkey and, they, and Jesus rides ahead on the red carpet. 
Now, some of the Pharisees are concerned. Oh, let me, before we get to the Pharisees, let me back up. And they are, they are shouting two things. One is from Psalm 118, which is just before those pilgrimage psalms begin. The pilgrimage psalms begin at 120. 119 is that long psalm that's the acrostic, that's the Hebrew ABCs uh, that is there to, to teach Hebrew children not only their alphabet, but teach them about the faith. Psalm 118 is a psalm of victory for the king. And part of that psalm says, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so now they're shouting and singing this victory song or song psalm, and they're also shouting out Hosanna. And Hosanna is two Hebrew words put together, which means, please save us. And so they're shouting a victory song, and they're asking Jesus, save us. And for them, they mean save us, of course, from the Romans. And some of the Pharisees that are on the route, they say to Jesus, you've got to stop your followers from saying these things. And I think there's probably a two-part uh, purpose in that. Uh, on the one hand, the Pharisees may genuinely be concerned. Uh, the Romans weren't known for their finesse. And the Romans hear all of this shouting and singing and, and talk of the king coming into town. And the king is not a, 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 a Pilate who would be the representative of the king. Or the king is not Herod who would be the king of that region. But the king is this Jesus fellow riding on a donkey and having the palm branches put in front of him, him and all. Uh, they may retaliate not only against Jesus, but uh, indiscriminately against anybody who is out there. And the Pharisees may be trying to, to, to hedge off some kind of a bloodbath that the Romans might do. The Pharisees also, we know, and have been reading about uh, uh, all along, are jealous of Jesus and they are suspicious of Jesus. And so they just want him to shut up and go away. And so they say, tell your disciples that they've got to be quiet. And Jesus responds again with scripture saying, if they are quiet, even the stones will cry out. And this comes from Habakkuk, where Habakkuk is saying that even the stones and the bricks and the walls are, are seeing the injustice. In Habakkuk's time, it was the, the injustice of Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. And if the people don't cry out for justice, the very stones and the walls will cry out. And Jesus says, if my followers are, are quiet, even the stones will be crying out because Jesus is coming in his own way and a, a rather a unusual way or unsuspected way is coming to bring justice, of course. And so we have this unlikely king on this unlikely mount, and yet the th crowds are thrilled because they do have this hope that this Passover will be the Passover to really end all Passovers, when God will come and establish his reign and throw the Romans out, and forever and ever Israel will reign over all of uh, the world. Uh, this Passover is, of course, going to be a Passover unlike any other, and it is the Passover of all Passovers, just not in the way that they imagine. And we see that in Jesus' response. Jesus looks over the whole scene, and his response is to weep. And not coming in uh, arrogant and proud like many kings might, but coming in weeping. And he says, if only you knew the things that make for peace. And literally we know he's saying, as he said earlier, those that live by the sword are going to die by the sword. And he knows that in just a few decades, the, the Jews are going to raise up against the Romans in a violent insurrection, and all of Jerusalem is going to be absolutely leveled. And, and, so, and Jesus uh, predicts this, you know, that this is going to happen. And he's weeping because if only you knew the things that uh, make for peace. But it's not only uh, that uh, literally Jerusalem would be destroyed, but that all of us, you and I, not only Jerusalem, but all of us, do things which do not make for peace for us. We engage in sin, and we, we let sin distract us and harry us, and we do things that, that cause great damage to ourselves and to others. Literally or figuratively, we live by the sword, we live by sin, and we die by the sword. We die by sin, and Jesus weeps. He also weeps, surely, because he knows even as he comes into Jerusalem as a king, he's going to leave Jerusalem on Friday as a corpse, as he is taken out of town. Uh, actually, he leaves uh, and is crucified out of town and, and then becomes a corpse, of course, and will be buried on the outskirts of Jerusalem, riding in on a donkey that has never been ridden, buried in a tomb that has never been used. And so Jesus weeps. And so Palm Sunday can never be for us uh, a day 
full of only praise and full only of, of celebration. Uh, many churches and, and, and even uh, uh, Christian traditions have moved to calling it Palm slash Passion Sunday because we can't go just from Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday without going through Good Friday. And just as Jesus weeps for us because we simply will not and cannot listen and he knows that he is going to have to offer his body for us and his blood for us, we have to go through Good Friday after Palm Sunday recognizing that Jesus has to do this for us because we simply would not know or understand or act out those things which make for peace. And this does, I think, leave for us a choice. Part of the sin of the crowds was that they were trying to make Jesus be who they wanted Jesus to be. Many people have speculated that's what Judas was doing as well. He was trying to get Jesus arrested to force him to finally take up arms against the Romans. And it wasn't Judas's intention that Jesus be killed, but that he could force his hand. Jesus, I want you to be the Savior like I want you to be. But Jesus wants us not to try to make him into our image or to make him into what we want him to be, but to, for him to allow us for, for, for us to allow him, excuse me, to mold us into his image and to allow us to be what he wants us to be. That can ultimately only be accomplished through the cross and Jesus will go through the cross. But even now, we need to begin to allow ourselves to be molded by Jesus and to accept what he's going to do for us on Friday and to accept the way that Jesus expects us to be and who Jesus expects us to be so that Easter Sunday truly can transform us. Will you pray with me as we prepare to go into Holy Week? Lord Jesus, we do confess that so often we want to make you into our image. We want to mold you into whatever we want. But help us this day, uh, this week, to pray as you prayed. Father, not my will, but yours be done. Jeremiah says that you're the potter and that we are the clay. Help us to make our clay soft, that you might mold us into the people that you want us to be. Lord, I pray that this Holy Week will be a Holy Week perhaps unlike any that we have ever experienced, more than uh, ever before for many of us in our lifetimes. This is a Holy Week in which we need not to be reminded of death because it is all around us, but to be reminded of the hope that you offer to us, to be reminded of resurrection and new life. And so take us from this Saturday and then into Palm Sunday and then through Holy Week and into Easter. Help us experience it in ways that will leave us transformed and transformed for you. We pray these things in your name, knowing that you are with us. Amen.